Almost every neighborhood has at least one family that seems to shy away from their neighbors. Rumors often swirl as a result. What does this family do behind closed doors? Why do they seem so reclusive and unwilling to connect with the community? In most cases, these questions are left unanswered and these reclusive neighbors remain shrouded in mystery. But on July 22nd of 2015, one of these families made headlines around the nation with millions of Americans suddenly turning their attention towards the Bever family of Oklahoma. Their household became the site of one of the most shocking crimes in recent history, which is now referred to as the Broken Arrow Killings. On that fateful night, two teenage brothers, then 18-year-old Robert Bever and his 16-year-old brother, Michael, decided to kill their entire family. Only two people survived. One was a 13-year-old girl who somehow recovered from a slit throat and multiple stab wounds to the stomach and arms. Another two-year-old sister was left unharmed and slept through the entire incident. The rest of the family was not so lucky. So he was buying weapons because you guys had talked about murdering. Yeah, and he started planning again. Okay. And then went along with it because I had to be the other way. I thought I didn't want to do it. I better quickly learn tonight that I didn't. Okay. That okay. you didn't want to do it? I didn't want to do it. I didn't, um, just because I didn't kill anyone. Okay. I stabbed someone. Who did you stab? Um, my younger brother, Christopher. Christopher? How was Christopher? Um, what exactly caused this reclusive family to implode in such a violent, bloody fashion? What drove these boys to murder? The Bever family was almost invisible to their neighbors prior to the killings. No one knew their names, and people rarely saw them outside of the house. To this day, we still don't really know much about this family. In fact, the most detailed information comes from the killers, who testified in court about their family lifestyle prior to the murders. The boys describe their family, particularly their father, as abusive and controlling. But can we really trust the testimony of two teens facing life in prison? Do you guys not like your mom and dad? I mean, is there, are they, I mean, I'm, most teenagers don't like their parents, so I can understand that. Yeah, I mean, mom's okay, but dad was okay. Just a little bit too much. Many of the neighbors described the Bevers as polite and nice. One even described the mom as a mother hen. The two boys who would eventually slaughter most of their family were described as extremely intelligent. They reportedly had a passion for computers, one shared by their father, who reportedly worked as a database administrator. We know the children were homeschooled and they did not have much contact with other children their age outside of the home. What makes this even more puzzling is that someone burned down the Bever family home in 2017. Eventually, a memorial was built on the site of the home, and any trace of the Bever family has now been completely wiped from the face of the city. If there was any evidence left inside the home, it's gone now. While it was later revealed that the parents had probably been physically and verbally abusive, their neighbors had every reason to believe that the children were taken care of for and loved. In other words, there was zero warning of what was about to happen, and that's what makes this crime so strange. David and April Bever had seven children together. At the time of the deaths, their youngest child was two, while their eldest was 18. By the end of the night on July 22nd, only four family members remained. So what exactly happened? At 11.30 p.m., Broken Arrow police received a 911 call from the Bever household. It was 12-year-old Daniel Bever. Hello? Hi. Hi, where are you at? Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, 7411. What address? 709 Magnolia Court. Seven, okay. Are you the only one there? No. My brother's attacking my family. Your dad is attacking your family? No, my brother. Daniel was in uh, his room, just you know, down the hall. Okay. And um, I was like, let me in, and he let me in. He was sitting on the phone with the police. I grabbed the phone, you know, which is my phone, got my phone. And then I went into the kitchen and I smashed the underground. 
It is because of 12-year-old Daniel Bever's heroic phone call to call the police that the brothers were apprehended when they were. The word heroic is used a lot these days, but the fear that must have gripped him as he huddled behind the TV listening to his family being attacked must have been overwhelming. The act of being level-headed enough to take the second to find a phone and take it with you rather than simply dashing out the door or hiding is heroic. This boy's effort to call 911 probably helped save his 13-year-old sister's life. Daniel would later die in the attack. Police responded quickly, arriving at the home within about 10 minutes. However, by the time they set foot on the property, the damage had already been done. Robert and Michael's sister, 13-year-old Crystal, was the first victim. Everyone was in bed except for the brothers, Crystal, and their mother. Crystal testified in court that she was told by her mother that the brothers needed to do the dishes and she was told to deliver the message. When she knocked on their bedroom door, she saw that they were putting on body armor and had several knives laid out on the bed. She had seen them don the body armor before. She testified that when she was in the room, Michael said to Robert, should we do it now? Robert replied, yes. Michael then told Crystal to look at something on his computer. When she did, Robert came up behind her and slit her throat. Robert Bever testified that the plan was for Crystal to die quickly and then they would drag her body to the closet. However, Crystal did not die quickly and fought back as Robert repeatedly stabbed her. And then my mom came in and she started yelling, called the police, get that. And then we came over and started attacking her. They actually got up and ran out with the gun too. Wow. And uh, they went small on the ground. He got up and started chasing after her. And what were you doing? Did you come out in the hallway? No, I was just standing in the room and the process, I don't know what I was doing. The guys that are interviewing Robert um, kind of gave me a quick version of what he's saying that you did. Yeah. And, and you haven't told me everything, okay? So I know you're not being completely honest, and uh, I gave you one shot already. I'm sorry, I don't know what you said. I mean, I Well, you stabbed more than one person. So who else did you stab? Same. Or you stabbed more than just one time? Oh, I stabbed Chris more than one time. How many times did you stab him? I think twice. Because you don't think we're going to know that? Stop I, thinking I and go with what you know. You mentioned forensics a minute ago. I know. I mean, I'm, I'm just one of like hundreds of people that are going to look at this thing, okay? I know. I mean, we got, we got the state police coming in. Uh, there's, I don't know, 20 different forensic detectives at your house right now. Um, They're going to be there a long time because of the scene that it is. So everybody that you killed and every single stab wound that you inflicted, we're going to know about. And this is your last chance to just kind of let us know, to be honest, to man up and, and tell us exactly what you did and, and start making it right. I had Christopher. I did not stab Victoria or Daniel. You did not stab them. Yeah, yeah, I, I, um, I tried to stab them. You stabbed them off. That's good. Yeah, I got it. When she was walking around, she had to go for a night, but, you know. I, Is that when you cut yourself? Then? Yeah, I think I'd have to do that. Where did you stab her? I just had to go from behind it. Go by. Did you cut her? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Crystal Bever ran screaming from the bedroom and headed toward the front door. As she ran, she heard her mother scream. Crystal ran outside but was dragged back inside of the house. It is because of her attempt to escape, her blood trail left on the front porch that told the police that forcing themselves into the home was necessary. Crystal Bever was found towards the front of the house, lying on the ground in a pool of blood and suffering from multiple stab wounds. She reportedly told police that her brothers were responsible for the murders. Crystal was then quickly transported to a nearby hospital in critical condition. Thanks to the life-saving efforts of medical professionals, her condition eventually stabilized. After finding Crystal, Broken Arrow police continued to search the house and discovered five deceased members of the family. And then that's about the time Dad came down okay. because his bedroom was upstairs. Um, they started attacking there. They got a little, little bit of a fight, um, but then eventually Robert got him down and um, I think he killed him. David, the father, had suffered a total of 28 stab wounds to the torso, face, neck, and arms. 
April, the mother, had been killed by what police described as blunt force trauma, with a total of 48 wounds across her entire body. Daniel and Crystal, Crystal locked himself in bed through Daniel locked himself in dad's office. Okay. And then I finally got both of them to open to Joe um, because they thought that I wanted in there. But they were in different rooms? Yeah, they were right yeah, next to each other. And I was like, I said, hello, Robert's after me, and they both opened up. In which room did you go? I went into the bathroom, just, you know, I stepped close to food. Okay. But then what did Robert go? Robert went into the uh, office where Daniel was stabbed, and Daniel ran off, and he came into the bathroom and started stabbing Christopher. I left. Daniel, the 12-year-old boy who had managed to call 911, was found dead with 21 stab wounds to his upper body. Seven-year-old Christopher had also been killed with 21 stab wounds across the body. And then, who's the youngest, the four-year-old? The four-year-old? I don't know what happened to this I hope she's alive. Right? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm... The youngest victim was five-year-old Victoria, who had suffered 23 stab wounds. And then basically after that, the victim was pretty much dead. We forgot about Who was dead? Everyone, I think. Okay. Thankfully, police found two-year-old Autumn asleep and unharmed in a room. Was that the plan was to kill her too, though? We just want to kill Okay. Yeah. And that was a knock at the door. Oh, okay. Someone knocked at the door. I think that might be the neighbor because the police wouldn't have been there yet. And then they just kept knocking on the door. So we turned around. I grabbed on. I uh, put my soft vest and heavy vest on. I was carrying the plates. I put my helmet on. And then we ran, we ran out the back door of Dan's office. When police arrived, the killers escaped out of the back door, running into the forest behind the home. I climbed over the fence. One started coming through the woods. Uh, we both collapsed. And we saw we were just sitting there, and they found us. They managed to evade police for several hours before they were eventually caught with the help of police dogs and officially arrested the next day on July 23rd. Both boys were found covered in dry blood and mud, and Robert was still clutching a knife. At this point, the police and the entire Broken Arrow community were still trying to figure out what had happened. Remember, this is a community of about 100,000 people, and this city only saw about one homicide per year prior to this incident. But as the details started to unravel, it became clear that this was the worst atrocity that Broken Arrow had ever experienced. We don't know exactly what happened prior to the police arriving. However, it's clear that Robert and Michael attempted to wipe out their entire family. One police report stated that there were surveillance cameras found near the bodies, and it was suggested that the boys planned to post the footage of the murders online. Obviously, this footage was never released, but the killers themselves have described exactly how they went about this horrific act. First of all, the murder weapons were knives, hatchets, and other bladed weapons. Police later recovered a wide range of additional items in the home, including swords, machetes, gloves, darts, and protective Kevlar sleeves. Some reports suggested that the two boys lured their family members into secluded areas of the house before murdering them. Another report states that one of the boys pretended to be under attack, which drew various family members to a secluded area of the home. With the entire family silenced except for critically wounded Crystal Bever, police turned to the killers themselves to learn more about the murders. This is where it starts to get strange. Robert allegedly seemed calm and laid back when he was questioned by the police. Robert apparently laughed or chuckled on several occasions as he told interrogators how he had planned to store the bodies of his family in the attic before stealing his parents' car. Michael, as you can see from his interrogation footage, was totally laid back. Both brothers explained that they had planned to continue their murder spree with the aim of reaching a kill count of up to 500 people, with a minimum of 100 as their goal. So when y'all got done at the house, where were you going to go? Um, we were going to hang out there for at least the day, clean up, and then wait for the ammunition, and go pick up the guns, and then go all leave the next day. Where, where, where were you going to go? I mean, where was your going to be your mass plan to get the um, most people, the most bang for your buck? We're just heading uh, generally towards Washington State. We're going to uh, do it statewide. Did you guys have, like, like where are you going to go? I mean, who else were you going to kill? Just whoever you ran into? Yeah, pretty much. We, he said five at a time, like gas stations, restaurants. Okay, and then just keep going. Yeah. It eventually became clear that the boys idolized serial killers particularly Robert, who wanted to become famous for murdering as many people as possible. 
This would explain their decision to set up surveillance cameras around the home prior to the killings. Why did he want to do it? To uh, kill people? Yeah. Um, well, it's mainly two reasons, I think. It's um, because he just, like, he says he hates everyone. He thinks society is pointless, and so he wanted to kill people. Yeah, and he yeah. also he wanted to, like, beat, uh, beat the kill, like, amount of other famous People like Columbine and uh, James Egan Holmes. Okay. Did you kind of feel that way too? Like when you guys were talking earlier, like... Yeah. It, like, do you have a problem with society too, you think? No, no I just... Or you were just more like the, the number of people getting killed was kind of interesting and yeah, like exciting. That. Yeah. Okay. Robert and Michael also explained that their mother and father often spent many hours locked away in their offices. They claim that 52-year-old David put locks on many doors throughout the home, and this might explain their need to lure family members out of their offices and rooms. Under interrogation, Robert also explained how he had killed the youngest boy in the family, Christopher. He then explained how he killed many of the other family members. During the interrogation, Michael clearly confesses to personally murdering at least one of his family members. However, he would later attempt to put all of the blame on his brother in an effort to escape legal consequences. When Crystal Bever miraculously recovered from her life-threatening injuries, she was questioned by police. This 13-year-old girl is one of the most reliable sources of information we have about the murders. She stated that her parents used to throw their children around in a physically abusive manner, Crystal also stated that she had overheard her parents saying that they were probably too hard on Michael and Robert when they were younger, and that Robert told her he had planned to behead two-year-old Autumn, but the mother chalked it up to boys being boys. Both boys faced life sentences for their roles in the murders. Robert was tried as an adult and sentenced to multiple life sentences without parole. Years later, he was spotted with the tattoos 5XLWOP, five times life without parole, and life across his fingers. He also attempted suicide at least once while incarcerated and allegedly attempted to attack a prison guard with a homemade knife. These boys like blades. While Robert's case was relatively cut and dry, Michael's was a little more complex. There was initially some debate over whether or not Michael should be tried as an adult since he was under the age of 18 when the murders took place. Initially, both boys pleaded not guilty, but Robert eventually accepted a plea deal. Both brothers were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. How do, how do you feel about what you've done now? I, I didn't like it. The minute it started. I, I mean, how do you feel about your mother? I mean, you, I mean she, you watched her get stabbed. You, you cut her throat yourself, and you watched her bleed all over the place and scream. How does that make you feel? You don't want to think about it. And Christopher, your little brother, I mean, you stabbed him in the neck. What, did, what has he ever done to you? So he's just a number. Yes. And how does it, I mean, how do you feel about that now? It's pointless. It's what? Pointless. Pointless. 